Greetings, viewers. I am the Sheriff CJ Rampiri, and I'm the Council of Societies in the Val Triangle Campus. And I am studying BA Law, my final year student. To intellectualize African languages means that we need to promote them and uphold them in a sense that we need to have books, stories about them, and in, in a sense that we write them, we read them, and we teach learners about the African languages. Of course, it will be challenging in a sense that now our generation is more interested in English, they are more interested in speaking English and writing English and in knowing English. And in, so it, it's going to be difficult to stick to our indigenous languages. And for us to succeed with intellectualization will help us in a sense that it will help us to sustain our African languages, it will help us to promote them, and it will help us to ensure that we teach the young ones where we come from. It is very important for us to know our culture, to know where we come from. So if we intellectualize them and succeed with doing that, so it will help us so that people will know, our children will know where we come from as, as, as African people. My name is Lynn Mario Menis Lesouza. I am Professor of Language Education at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, I work with um, critical pedagogies, applied linguistics, multilingualism, language policy, and uh, post and decolonial theories. I'm here to share some ideas of mine on what you call uh, intellectualization, uh, which is not exactly a problem that uh, we have here in the area which I research, uh, which is indigenous languages in Brazil. Um, but there are certainly uh, connections to be made. Um, we are in both, like us, you are also talking about trying to recuperate invisibilized excluded languages uh, from a previous situation, uh, which we could call colonial. So um, what I'd like to say is that um, I see three possible postures towards the problem. And I call them a political posture, a top-down linguistic posture, and a bottom-up linguistic posture. The political posture gives cultural and academic value to languages previously excluded and undervalued, and invisibilized during colonization. And this posture demands a democratic right for education in the mother tongue. The second posture, the top-down linguistic posture, sees language as a static, abstract, and structural system. And it sees the mother tongue as a clearly bounded entity, distinct from the other languages with which it cohabits in the nation. The third, bottom-up linguistic posture, here it is, language is seen by its users and not in a contextual or cultural vacuum. Here, language is seen as a dynamic set of available multiple linguistic resources for interaction. Here it is not a question of languages as in the top-down posture, but of repertoires. And in multilingual contexts, such as that of indigenous languages in Brazil, repertoires may include linguistic resources from across a spectrum of what the top-down linguistic posture perceives as languages, as independent, bounded um, syst systems. In this sense, one needs to rethink and amplify the notion of a mother tongue, not as a closed static monolingual system, but as a repertoire of linguistic resources from what could otherwise be considered multiple languages. There are, of course, problems with each of these three postures. The main problem that I see with the political posture is that in its attempt to promote multilingualism as the respect for and the equality among multiple languages, it may in fact end up promoting the, <clears throat> the monolingualism of the previously excluded, invisibilized local language. The main problem of the top-down linguistic posture is that it doesn't take into account the role of literacy and its accompanying effects of decontextualization and standardization. 
these could have these could have extremely negative effects on the existence of prevailing oral traditions in the language that the top-down linguistic posture seeks to defend. To intellectualize a language means to reduce it to writing, thus standardizing it and disconnecting the language from the oral tradition of the community. This would privilege the discourses of written culture, very different from those of oral traditions, where context, repetition, intonation, and the immediacy of possible interaction with a listener are important. If, as happens when oral traditions are transferred to writing, they are reduced to content independent of oral rhetoric and oral form, the simplified result may devalue the ancestral worth of the tradition. The problem of the third posture, the bottom-up linguistic posture, is this, considering that it values the mother tongue as a multilingual repertoire, it needs a political strategy that would protect it against the possibility of the repertoire being progressively cleansed of its non-hegemonic elements under prevailing institutional and national forces tending towards the monolingual. That is, um, if we are talking about repertoires, maintaining a mother tongue as a, a cross-linguistic repertoire in a school, it may be the, the forces, the homogenizing, standardizing forces of the school may in fact end up reducing the repertoire to um, a monolingual language. Uh, the example of indigenous schools in Brazil perhaps may shed some light on what I'm saying. Though indigenous schools in Brazil are permitted to teach in their own languages, Many communities choose to use the national language, Portuguese, in their schools. What motivates this is a perception of the difference between education on the one hand and schooling on the other. Where education is what occurs in traditional oral and extramural forms and which has happened and occurred continuously over 500 years in spite of colonization, and where schooling is what occurs within the four walls of a schoolhouse inserted in written culture, introduced by colonization. These communities see schooling as a threat to their traditions and their view of education, but also as a necessary political strategy to becoming citizens of the non-indigenous nation without jeopardizing their traditional notions of education. This obviously results in bilingualism and a perception that just as Portuguese may not be compatible with indigenous languages and indigenous knowledge, indigenous languages may not be compatible with Western knowledges. However, it must be remembered that this is not a posture that sees languages, cultures and knowledges as separate and fixed, but as resources which together form a complex repertoire within an open system, as it were. So just some concluding remarks. The problem may ironically lie in how and from where one considers intellectualization as an imperative. If it is considered from a Western perspective of written culture and modern science inherited from colonial history and monolingual colonizing nations, the demand for a monolingual bounded mother tongue as a medium for academic production as a move towards decolonization may in fact be mirror mirroring colonial values. It may be seeking to replace one form of uh, monolingualism with another. Clearly, one cannot wish to turn the clock back on colonial history. It has left us entangled in multiple languages and cultures. And it is from and through these entanglements that one must think, avoiding the pitfalls of either or solutions. Such, I think, is the endeavor of thinking multilingualism otherwise. I hope this small contribution may help in thinking um, through the intellectual intellectualization of languages in South Africa. Thank you. I am Professor Abiyotun Salau acting director of the
indigenous language media in Africa, a such entity at the Northwest University in South Africa. This is my response to the question, what does it mean to intellectualize African languages in South Africa? Um, to intellectualize African languages in South Africa means to be able to use uh, those historically diminished languages for education in any field of human endeavors from the primary to tertiary level. This presupposes that uh, the languages are able to be used for discussion of theories and concepts uh, in the different uh, disciplines or subjects. It is also to plan for the process of accelerating the, the growth and the development of the indigenous languages uh, for them to be used in domains of science and technology, government, uh, and legislature, business and economy, quality journalism, and other aspects of modern life. I emphasize quality journalism here because uh, journalism has been practiced you know, in African languages, but in tab tabloid forms. Uh, that is, African language journalism has not been able to grapple you know, with some uh, uh, serious, quote unquote, or technical matters, probably because of the limitation of uh, our languages to cope with the registers, you know, of those uh, uh, technical areas. Uh, for instance, African language journalism has not uh, been reporting science and technology. Uh, they have also not been uh, uh, reporting business and economy. Yeah. So to intellectualize uh, African languages, you know, would mean to be able to use our languages to report issues like that, like science and technology, business and the economy, um, legislature and all that. My name is Professor Russell Kashula. I'm presently the NRF Chair in the Intellectualization of African Languages, Multilingualism and Education at Rhodes University. Um, my research interests are in applied language studies um, and forensic linguistics. What does it mean to intellectualize African languages in South Africa? According to Havranek, um, this intellectualization culminates in scientific theoretical speech determined by the attempt to be as precise in expression as possible to make statements which reflect the rigor of objective scientific thinking in which the terms approximate concepts and the sentences approximate logical judgments. But I think this intellectualization cannot be seen as a single process, but rather, according to Gonzalez, um, as a phenom phenomenon of many dimensions. It includes various aspects and stages of what other scholars have called language cultivation and modernization. Such aspects include various activities, such as the following, the development of orthographies of hitherto unwritten languages, as well as standardization and harmonization of orthographies in cases of linguistic and social variation, the development of grammars and language learning handbooks, the development and standardization of specialized technical and professional registers for various professional and ac academic disciplines, i.e. terminology, the compilation and production of various types of dictionaries, i.e. lexicography, textbook production for different educational levels as per language in education policies, translation of various texts from other languages, and then finally the development and localization of modern technological tools and software for language processing and advanced communication purposes, i.e. human language technology. Um, and finally, it should also be noted that the intellectualization of languages does not occur in a vacuum, 
but occurs in the context of hegemonic traditions, policies, and practices. And this is the same for all of our South African languages as well. The process is an integral part of socioeconomic, cultural, political, and intellectual evolution of our society. Well, first of all, I'm Professor Langa Kumalo, the director of the South African Center for Digital Language Resources at Northwest University. Um, I'm a linguist. I'm also a corpus linguist. I have also worked in the area of uh, computational linguistics, uh, focusing on natural language processing. Um, and of course, I have worked very extensively in uh, language planning. So what does intellectualization mean to me? Uh, intellectualization uh, is a very broad area that dates back to the Prague School. And it uh, means for African languages to provide facilities that enable an African language to develop a lexicon and logical expression that makes it possible for it to function in teaching and learning in higher education, in research, in scientific innovations, and in all spheres of life. And by all spheres of life, I also want to include articulation in the media, where it, it finds expression in, in, in uh, what you call community radios, uh, where contact is with societies that speak specific uh, languages, and of course, having newspapers that actually publish in these African languages. So it is a language that has the capacity to have the whole gamut of expressive capacity from mundane to the most scientific. That, to me, is an intellectualized language. My response to the question or the questions what are the challenges to the intellectualization of African languages in South Africa and uh, what solutions can we uh, bring to those challenges these are major challenges you know of uh, the intellectualization of African languages in South Africa uh, problem of attitude you know to the use of these languages you know uh, for educational purposes in particular yeah, uh, it is a problem problem of coordination you know, of the various structures, you know, uh, that are involved in, de in development of terminology. Yeah, and of, uh, also, you know, uh, the problem of an uh, inadequate number of trained lexicographers, you know, and of course, you know, the uh, inadequate uh, uh, terminology and the relevant materials, you know, like dictionaries and all that. So what are the uh, solutions? Um, in 1998, you know, uh, government, you know, came up, you know, with a, a program called the Olozela uh, Language Awareness Campaign. Yeah. Um, at least, you know, if that uh, campaign did not achieve anything, you know, it led to the tendency to use uh, African languages in, in provincial legislatures and also, you know, for uh, interpreting, you know, in courts. Yeah, so language awareness, you know, uh, campaign, you know, would uh, go a long way to uh, bring about some uh, of the some solutions to these uh, challenges, uh, particularly, you know, change in attitude, you know, to the African languages. Uh, in in that way, we will see the uh, this language awareness week, you know, uh, uh, being organized by the Northwest University yeah, as a very right step, you know, in the right direction. Yeah, another solution, you know, will be uh, creating new terminologies within a short period and uh, maximize their acceptance. Also, you know, the the existing terminologies, you know, should be collected and codified, yeah, and disseminated, you know, to uh, the relevant uh, target. Um, another. Uh, solution that we can bring to these uh, to these uh, challenges it is uh, the pragmatic approach to the uh, 
uh, okay, let me put it this way, pragmatic approach for the development of modern terminology uh, for use, you know, for use in science and technology. Uh, in, 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 in this vein, we do not have to be too, uh, too much of language purists. Uh, the kind of African languages, you know, spoken in townships, you know, can can be used. We can start from there. It may not be the, 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 the it, it may not be the uh, uh, the real thing to do, but at least we can start there, uh, so that uh, 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 the African language use can be embraced by our students, by our youth. Yeah, uh, this involves you know code switching and code mixing. Of course, you know we can. Uh, uh, talk about uh, the issue of uh, human language technologies. Yeah, we can we can bring that in, uh, and this involves uh, uh, text text to, to speech. Uh, yeah, uh, it it, it uh, involves uh, automatic uh, language uh, dictation. Yeah, and uh, it it involves you know uh, online dictionaries, online. Um, Terminal, uh, online glossaries, yeah, for, for the languages, yeah, because this is digital age, and uh, our, our use, you know, mostly embrace, you know, uh, things on the, on digital platform, and uh, it is also believed that uh, uh, if we have uh, uh, those resources, you know, online, it will be accessible accessible to uh, to many people uh, uh, at little or no cost, yeah. So it's important to do that. Uh, so we need, you know, to really strive, you know, to put uh, African language, uh, African languages on the digital platform. And then, uh, lastly, you know, I talk about uh, harmonization and standardization of uh, orthographies. Yeah, it has been said that um, um, uh, many African languages, you know, belong to uh, uh, certain language families. Uh, for instance, you know, Ungude languages, you know, we we'll talk of. Uh, this is Zulu, Isikosa, Siswati, and this is Indebele. So these languages can come together, you know, to harmonize and standardize, you know, uh, their orthography. And by so doing, it will be easier, it will be cost effective, yeah, to develop materials, you know, in, in, in such languages, to develop terminology in such uh, languages. Thank you. So it can't really be doubted that early if, uh, orthographic um work in African languages was spearheaded by many by the missionaries uh, but this, and this has provided the basis for the intellectualization of some African languages today. However, it can also be seen that the work would encounter challenges which I'll try and outline. Um, and this is primarily because of the problems associated with the complex nature of orthographic work, orthographic reforms, uh, and these have remained prominent tasks for language planners on the continent. And in South Africa, bodies like Pansalb uh, and their predecessors have been producing terminology and orthography booklets for African languages um, and updating writing systems. But nevertheless, these um, orthography challenges remain and they also affect the intellectualization of African languages. So the notion of harmonization of African languages focusing mainly but not exclusively on orthographies is also premised on the flaws of missionary orthographies, particularly the idea that the distinction between some of the languages is superficial. Um, and this debate was initiated by Jacob and Klapo and then continued by the late Professor Neville Alexander um, and more recently Professor Kwesi Kwapra uh, with the Centre for Advanced Studies of African Society. Um, and I think primarily the issues of standardization also uh, and harmonization have to be resolved uh, appropriately before we can fully intellectualize our African languages. And this is one of the major challenges. So the implementation of harmonized orthographies, just like orthographic or even linguistic reform generally has been quite difficult. Um, speakers of standardized languages also tend to be loyal to existing orthographies as if um, they were national or cultural emblems that should never be tampered with. Um, so the question of orthographies, of course, also and harmonization influences uh, the development of lexicographical work and dictionaries 
um, as part of the intellectualization process. And um, this will need to be resolved continentally and particularly in relation to South Africa uh, for further intellectualization to take place. So this remains an ongoing challenge. I think the biggest challenge uh, in the intellectualization of African languages is the lack of uh, what we call resources. And I want to use resources in a broad sense. Uh, and then I will chop it up to resources that pertain to expertise, i.e. the expertise that lie in the foundational theories towards the development of a particular language. That is vitally important to have a scientific framework towards intellectualization of a particular language. That there is paucity of that skill. There is also a paucity of uh, funding for African languages. African languages in the African continent do not naturally attract financial resources. They are viewed as something that does not necessarily need investment in. And because of that, uh, African languages uh, do not um, get the investment it requires, the attention it requires, the resources that are necessary for, for them to develop to the level that they are required uh, to develop. And then you will see that there is also paucity of grammars, and I mean linguistic grammars. Some African languages are not even written. They are not documented languages. So um, the lack of grammars and, 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 and of sound grammars at that, uh, some of the grammars that are in existence are, al are also based on archaic uh, theories that are no longer uh, of main use in, in the understanding of, of language and society that we, 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 we subsist in. And then the lack of dictionaries uh, that are necessary because they are the lexicon that you require uh, to, ex to, to express uh, to, to have the expressive power of the language. So the lexicon is not fully developed, and so dictionaries are not there. And even dictionary culture is not there. Uh, English has an amazing dictionary culture. Uh, when, when, when you go into an English lesson, you have the necessary tools to walk into that English lesson. The teacher will prompt you whether you have the lexicon or the word list at the end of a grammar book. Uh, when you have limitations in the understanding of a particular lexical item, you have access to a dictionary, be it a, a hard copy dictionary or an electronic dictionary, they have resources, these fully fledged developed languages. But African languages lack those resources. That's another thing that actually uh, prescribe, uh, uh, impact negatively on the development or, or intellectualization of these uh, uh, languages. And so, you have lack of resources that pertain to the teaching and learning of these languages. And then there's something, a caveat, uh, that actually lends itself as a result of the paucity of those two uh, main things, grammar and, and uh, uh, the lexicon, the reading culture. It is very difficult uh, to see an African uh, language learning student to be carrying a novel to read in a past time. Uh, to be carrying uh, a good uh, grammar book to read in their pastime. So there is lack of that reading culture. And in, in a fully intellectualized language is a language that is written a lot, a language that is spoken a lot, a language that, is, that, that articulates every single idea because it can, it has the capacity, it carries the capacity. So the lack of these resources proscribe the development of African languages. And then the space. In terms of teaching space in the curriculum, in terms of uh, the space in the academy, especially higher education, some of the universities in this country or in most African countries don't even teach African languages. And when they are taught, they are taught in another language, in English. You know, I can give you a lot of uh, African universities that are actually teaching African languages in English. And it befuddles the mind because you're actually thinking, why are they teaching this language in another language? 
Again, it is because the languages do not carry this scientific uh, capacity for, for it to be taught in itself. Um, and even the dictionaries, most of the, these languages have bilingual dictionaries. They hardly have monolingual dictionaries, i.e. a dictionary that has a, a lexical item in its language and a definition in the same language. Most of them are bilingual. You will find a, lex a lexical item in, 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 in this Zulu, for instance, is an example, and a definition in, in English. And then you wonder, is this an Isis Zulu dictionary? That's the problem with African uh, uh, languages. And that, of course, impedes the development of African languages. So these are the challenges that uh, African languages are faced. And that's why I characterized it as broadly the lack of resources and resources in a very uh, broad sense. I think the imperative uh, exists that uh, we need capacity. We need uh, well-trained African language teachers and well-motivated African language teachers. African language teachers that love language. The, 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 the tragedy in most cases is that, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I go back to my time when I was at the university, uh, they, hardly you would find, and, I'm, I'm, and I use this uh, cautiously, a black language student who loves being a, a language student. They would have aspired to, to, to do law and their credits are less, and then they find themselves doing a BA or a BEd degree and uh, training in language or language teaching. So they are from this onset not passionate about language. They, are, they have failed in something and they land themselves in this uh, space. So we need to correct the, 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 fo the passion and focus. You have to have people who love language and therefore love the, the right way of teaching language. So that, and who understand the, the reason why language must be taught correctly or accurately. Because then you have your ducks in a row. The, the language lecturer has been trained well, has received sufficient training, and they will train or teach language the way it's supposed to be taught. There is passion in, in their teaching uh, of, of language. So we need to train our teachers and, and, and carry the passion in the teaching of African languages because that's what we need to teach them well so that we actually uh, motivate our students to love their language. This is my response to the question, why is it important to succeed uh, with the intellectualization of uh, African languages projects in South Africa. I want to believe that if we are able to intellectualize uh, South African languages, I mean the indigenous languages in South Africa, it will create avenue for access and the uh, dissemination of uh, indigenous knowledge in South Africa. Uh, and that means that uh, if these uh, languages are developed in such a way as to uh, be able to use them, you know, uh, effectively in the domains of science and technology and all that, it will create access to the knowledge, to the indigenous knowledge. And this indigenous, indigenous knowledge you know, will also be uh, able to be disseminated you know, uh, to various kinds of people everywhere in the world. Uh, that's, my, that's my sincere belief about this. By so doing, uh, it will make uh, African languages, you know, in South Africa, economically viable. Yeah, students and the people in the society can uh, see the uh, economic importance of these languages. Because now it's like, why should I embrace these languages, you know, if it's not going to help me to progress in life? 
if it's not something that I can uh, I can use, you know, to do my work as a scientist, uh, as an economist, as a banker, yeah, yeah, as a yeah, yeah, as even as a journalist, yeah, even as a journalist. So why should I uh, why should I want to uh, take it as anything important? But if they see the economic importance of these languages. If they know that uh, these languages are economically viable, they will be uh, embrace uh, of the languages. Uh, I also believe that uh, intellectualization of uh, African lang languages in South Africa will save these languages from extinction. Yeah, because uh, intellectualization of uh, languages actually begins with the use, with the use of those languages. Yeah, so. If the languages are able to be used in all human domains, all human endeavors, or in different domains of human endeavors, yeah, these languages, you know, will survive extinction. Uh, the, the languages, you know, will, will come alive. The languages will come alive, you know, the languages will, you know, will be strengthened because, you know, they will, they will, they will be available, you know, for use in every human domain. And with this, the languages, you know, will not die, you know, because they will be constantly used. Thank you. I think I'd like to highlight two issues here. The one is um, the use of technology and the other is the uh, development of the continent itself through the intellectualization of African languages. So we already know that Satellite Northwest University and uh, the University of South Africa have done a lot of work on human language technology. Um, and it's important, I think, to acknowledge this as part of the intellectualization process. And um, without intellectualization, we cannot take um, into, we, we can't make effective use of these human language technologies. Really, this um, for this to happen, we need the continued um, intellectualization of African languages. And um, I use the word continued um, deliberately because I think languages have always been intellectualized. We are just continuing the process. It's not as though we're starting anew. Even prior to the arrival of missionaries, our languages were intellectualized um, and used for educational purposes. The second point I'd like to make with regard to the importance of the success of this intellectualization project is that of development. And Eckhart Wolf makes the point very clearly that socioeconomic development cannot be divorced from issues related to language and to language empowerment on the African continent. And this is supported by Bamboshe when he states that development cannot be achieved unless it involves the participation of all in the developmental process. And such participation inevitably requires that people are reached and are able to reach others in the language or languages in which they are competent. So development is therefore about allowing people access to material wealth and to enable their economic participation in society through languages that they understand best. And ordinarily this would be the mother tongue of an individual in any given society. This is even more pronounced on the continents such as Africa, where the acquisition of exoglossic languages such as English, French and Portuguese remain a challenge. So if we talk about NEPAD and we talk about the Millennium Development Goals and so on, it's vitally important that the intellectualization of our African languages is continued in order to support this process of development um, on the African continent. The, 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 the UNESCO declaration is that it is axiomatic for every child to be taught in the language uh, that they understand the most, and that is the mother tongue. Because there are a lot of benefits in there. You are not just teaching them in a mother tongue. You are actually developing them cognitively. You are actually also developing their critical thinking skills. You are not also just uh, introducing a language in the curriculum. You are also affirming themselves because that's the only thing that they bring to, this, uh, to the learning environment. They bring their language. 
And when you actually teach them in their mother tongue, you are affirming that which they have brought, the first tool that they have brought into the classroom. You are affirming that. And that's an excellent starting point to affirm a child or a pupil's first language in a learning environment. And that actually empowers them. It is amazing the amount of power that actually bestows to the learner when you affirm the language that they bring to the classroom. And well, when you have done that, learning becomes a second nature because it's happening in a language that they're familiar with. So it is vitally important to, 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 to follow that UNESCO declaration. It is taken as axiomatic that a child must be taught in a language that they understand the most, and that is their mother tongue. But you can only do that, and you can do it well, when they find a teacher who has been properly trained and is equally passionate. So again, our education system must actually train our language teachers very well. And again, that goes to media. Um, when you communicate with a, a, a population or with a citizenship, you want to communicate to them effectively. Uh, and unfortunately, again, African politics has learned very well from the colonial past that information is power. And in order for them to control information, they disperse it in a language that the majority of the communities do not understand. So again, you can take it politically that actually it is deliberate politics that we don't empower these languages because by empowering these languages, we're empowering the communities that empower these languages. And therefore, uh, the, the, the governments of the day are going to be held to account because the power now lies with the people. So again, it's, it's a whole linguistic, political, socio-political, economic, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, because again, language is that important. It actually embeds what humanity is, you know? So there's all sorts of play that is happening when uh, language is in question. So yes, and of course, to come to why, it's a constitutional imperative. We empower these languages, we intellectualize African languages, particularly in South Africa, because it is a constitutional imperative. Our constitution says we must achieve for all the 11 official languages and hopefully 12 soon, parity of esteem. We must achieve that parity of esteem uh, for all the 11 official languages. And why? Because they must be treated equitably. Again, because we are that kind of nation that views each other as equal. And so we have to uh, provide uh, facilities, resources for these languages to achieve that parity of esteem. So once you embed the constitution, everything else uh, falls into place. It is a constitutional imperative. There is no section of this uh, country that must frown upon that phrase because it beats us to, to, to actually satisfy the imperative. And of course, once that is a constitutional imperative, it, begins, it becomes a linguistic right. It is a citizen's right for them to speak or to be spoken to in a language that they are comfortable with. So again, it is uh, once it's a linguistic right, that right must be protected. So we are bid uh, by a lot of factors to actually develop our languages to the satisfaction of the speakers of those languages, but it starts with the attitude. So language can really play a very important role in um transformation and if we speak about transformation at south african universities especially historically white universities then language is absolutely imperative in the whole transformation pr program and at Rhodes, we really started in 2006 with about 50 students and today on any given day we have around 800 students studying isiposam across campus and we also have a university staff course which allows you to carry on to an intermediary course and then to Isipoza 1 and through to a major and even to do honours. And some staff are following that route as well. So in a nutshell, that is basically what we've done. Um, and it's, uh, I just want to end with a quote from David Crystal who says that in 500 years time, it will be the case, if it's the case that everyone will
will automatically be introduced to English as soon as they are born. If this is part of a rich multilingual experience for our future newborns, this can only be a good thing. If it is by then the only language left to be learned, it will have been the greatest intellectual disaster that the planet has ever known. So there's an onus on us as academics to promote multilingualism, to intellectualize our languages, and to see our languages as a, as a rich resource in our lecture halls, rather than being a problem. Thank you.